starting a new series called Fake News. And I know that just the title alone can get a reaction. Everybody I've talked to about the series, they're like, hey, what's your new series? I'm like, fake news. And they go, ha, 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 ha. And I'm like, it's not political. But what we live in is a culture that that term is so prevalent in our day-to-day -day lives that, that it permeates everything. And so we live in a world where fake news and truth are really hard to distinguish. We're going to use this verse all throughout our series. And again, I apologize if I have to drink water. By the end of this, I may have a frog just jump out of my throat. Our verse that we're going to use over this whole series is found in Colossians 2, 7. It says, let your roots grow down into him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Say him. That's going to be really important later. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught. See, all throughout this verse, there's huge, huge meaning in it. Let your roots grow down in him. Let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth found in him. And you will overflow with thankfulness. What a great verse for the month of November as we get ready to enter into Thanksgiving. We have so much in our nation to be thankful for day in day out. But this is going to be our verse for the whole series. And what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at what the world tells us, which is often fake news, versus what the Bible tells us, which we believe is the infallible word of God, truth from front to back. We believe every answer, every societal disagreement, everything that you need for any situation is found right here in God's love letter to us. We'll be looking at both sides of the coin. We're also going to look at some things that may step or challenge your toes. And that's going to be some things that religion even says that may or may not be actually found in scripture. So as always, I want to encourage you, don't just take my word for it. I want to encourage you that if I say something that challenges you or challenges the way you were raised or challenges your denominational beliefs, I want to encourage you to go home Dig in, and this is what I know. You will find the truth. There's a great verse in the Bible that says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's an awesome verse. I titled this week's message, Salt Shaker Jesus. Salt Shaker. <laughs> That's, I knew when I titled it I was going to struggle with that one. Whole second grade's coming back with a vengeance. So Salt Shaker Jesus. Jesus, when we live in a culture that says, if I sprinkle enough Jesus on it, it's got to be true, right? If I could just throw out a little Jesus, if, if I could just mention Jesus, we see it all over the news. We see it all over our political spectrum. Is, there is so much fake news out there, and it's becoming more and more dangerous because so many people are buying into it. If you just sprinkle a little Jesus. It would amuse me at some of the things I hear and some of the things I read if it wasn't so dangerous. The false doctrine, the false teachings out there are becoming more and more dangerous. I was on social media the other day and, and I was looking and you know those sponsored ads that, that those churches put up like we do. Well, I always click on them because I judge other churches. So I clicked on it. And I wanted to see how good their social media stuff was. And I think it was like Rethink Church or something. It was a Methodist church, not knocking the Methodist. I know many of you came from that background. It was a Methodist church. It was a really ambiguous, you know, ad. It was just basically saying, hey, come join our church. They were in Atlanta or something. So I started scrolling. I always go to the comment section because that's the most amusing to me because I don't have enough drama in my life. I want to invest in other people's drama. So I went to the, to the comment section. And the level of aggression towards the church by this being a sponsored ad shocked me. I mean, there were statements all throughout it that, I mean, it was everything from I can't believe that you would believe in a, in a God. I can't believe that this religion, they were knocking Methodists, they were knocking Christians, they were knocking God, they were knocking the Bible. Apparently it being written by men and apparently it being old and, and all of the comments centered around, well, it's not meant for our culture. It's an outdated book. 
And I'm just like, the danger of that to me is, see, God's word is alive. And, and it's, it's daily in every one of our situations. And it saddens me when I read these kind of comments. We put a billboard across town just kind of trying to put some truth on it. The level of animosity and fakeness that, that our next generation and even some in our generation, even some within the church are believing these days really, really scares me. And I, I had a, somebody in the church that I greatly respect, and I didn't ask permission to use his name, so I won't mention Dale Montgomery's name in this. But, but what happened, we were out here in the parking lot a couple of weeks ago, and I said something to the effect, I said, man, the world's just getting darker and crazier. And he said, yeah. He said, but we were told, and we were prepared. And I thought, wow, that it was such an impactful statement. We were told, and this isn't going to be on the screen. I was actually digging in later in the week just off this, and I found this passage in, in 2 Peter. And for us as a church, it shouldn't be a surprise at all. It says this, but there were also false prophets in Israel, just as there will be false teachers among you. They were cleverly teach destructive heresies, and even deny God who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality. And because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get a hold of your money, prosperity. But God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will, be, will not be delayed. For God did not even spare the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell and gloomy pits of darkness. And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. So you see, God knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment. All throughout, I encourage you, go find 2 Peter chapter 2. It, it's, it's like a textbook description of what today looks like. If you read down through that whole thing, that's just a snippet of it. And I read this, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, I've seen this passage over and over. But as I read it this time, I'm like, wow. We see it all throughout our world. We're even starting to see it creep into the church, as we get closer and closer to, to the end times that the Bible talks about, we're seeing false teachers. We're seeing false religions. We're seeing false doctrine. We're seeing fake news even within the church. But hey, if you sprinkle enough Jesus, if you mention Jesus enough, people are buying into it. And here's the truth of it. People don't have a problem with spirituality. You can talk about spirituality all day long. I've said this over and over. Go to your workplace, talk about God. You can talk about God. Nobody has an issue with spirituality. Nobody has an issue with God. Nobody has an issue with higher powers, right? But you mentioned Jesus, and it changes. It changes the dynamic. Walk into your workplace and ask somebody, hey, what do you think about Jesus? And you watch the air get sucked out of the room. And here's why. Because Jesus made this statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You talk about God. Well, the majority of the world believes in God, a God. So it's not that offensive. But when you start talking about Jesus, when you start talking about the only way to heaven is through the Son of God, it creates tension. And in our world today, in New Age thinking, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere about it, right? We live in this culture that as long as you're sincere enough, as long as you're just really a good person, it's all okay. You see, Allah, when you start comparing Allah and God, right? Uh-oh, don't start talking about that. Pastor, I brought a friend. Good, they need to hear it. Allah and God, I keep hearing over and over and over is that they're, this, they're basically the same God and all roads lead to heaven. And, and you even have the Pope that made a mention about well, is it, all of them are basically the same. But you have to ignore the fact that Allah is an impersonal and an arbitrary God who determines your standing based on what you do and the works that you have. And you may or may not please him. And he's not a loving God. As a matter of fact, he's a, he's a distant God. And then when it comes to Jesus... Well, they sprinkle enough Jesus to make it sound okay, right? Because Jesus is a great man. He's a great prophet. But ultimately, they don't believe Jesus died on the cross. They don't believe he was resurrected. And they, they just think he was just a good old boy. And see, when you start really breaking it down, there is massive, massive differences. 
But Muslims are good people, right? Yes, a lot of them are. But sadly, their lack of belief in Jesus Christ is where the tension comes. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through the Son of God. And what's scary is Islam is the fastest growing religion in America. Go a little further. Shake a little salt. You look at Mormons. You've got a whole religion sweeping across our country, even within our own state, the most religious conservative state in the United States. You've got this religion sweeping through where they're the third largest religion in America. You might have had them knock on your door, and they'll sprinkle enough Jesus. Well, Jesus this and Jesus that, but ultimately what they believe is that Jesus was a man who became a God. God was man who became a God, and somehow they're going to be able to live good enough to become God themselves. You see, there's so much new age sprinkled into that, but people are buying into it and buying into its second largest, fastest growing religion in America. New age theology, you see it all over the place. You see it all throughout. And this is what's creeping into our churches is this new age theology where where if I just, you know, if it feels good, do it. There's really no, I mean, moral ambiguity. If it feels good, all roads basically lead to heaven. There's really not a hell. It's the lack of personal responsibility because I don't want to think that there's only one way to heaven. I don't want to think that I'm going to stand before a father and be judged about my actions. And it's all, it's all, this is the belief that the word of God is old and archaic and it doesn't fit our culture. So we need to change the word of God. All roads lead to a better place, higher power. We look at all these religions that are sweeping across America, and we haven't even talked about Wiccans and Hindus and Buddhists and all of that. It's growing leaps and bounds. And you know what the number one religion declining in America is? Christianity. Christianity. And it scares me that we live in this world of fake news, and without a voice, people will believe anything. We've got a mayor from Indiana, and I'm not getting political. But this guy's out there saying abortion is biblical. I don't even know where he got that. But he he twisted enough scripture and he sprinkled enough Jesus to say abortion is actually biblical, that life begins after breath. You have to remove all the other passages where God knew you before you were even created. And we have the, the homosexual and LGBTQT agenda creeping all throughout our churches. And it's okay. And Jesus is love, and you should love and accept everybody and see you sprinkle enough Jesus. And I'm making a lot of people really uncomfortable, but here's the truth of it. You have to remove all of the sexual sin verses in the Bible just to even get to this. And it's false doctrine, and it's false teaching. And we should absolutely love each and every person. The Bible says love your neighbor. Your neighbor is everyone around you. We should love Muslims, we should love homosexuals, we should love Mormons, we should love everybody. And in that love, they will come to know the truth, and the truth will set them free. But we live in a culture of fake news and distortion. And hey, if we sprinkle enough Jesus, it's got to be okay, right? Because the nature of Jesus was just to accept everything. No, it wasn't. The nature of Jesus was to love everybody. And for those who were looking for a savior, he was there. But not one time did he ever say, ah, you know what? That sin's okay. Just you just keep doing it. He actually raised the standard. He went into situations that everybody else was running from, but he raised the standard. And he was a savior for everyone who wanted to find freedom. Why does any of this matter? Because even though the war is won, And even though you may be sitting in here this morning and you may be secure in where you're going after you die, the truth of it is, is that we are still in a battle. And it's our job as a church to go into our community and fight that battle. Never did Jesus say give up the fight. Never did Jesus say become a doormat. As a matter of fact, Jesus said go into the world making disciples. You see, discipleship is active. Evangelism is active. It's go into the world. There are people in your workplace. There are people in your schools. There are your neighbors. There are your ballpark friends. There are your umpires. 
the, the lady in the checkout counter. They need to know about Jesus. And I believe that the number one tool in America for the enemy is apathy. It's apathy. We come into our really pretty buildings and we sit in our really cushioned chairs and we've got a really cool air conditioners or heaters depending on what hour it is in Alabama. And we're all right because I'm comfortable, right? As long as I'm comfortable, I can come in and give God a couple of my hours, check it off the box, and life is good. But that's not what we're called to do. There are studies out there that show that 90% of people you tell about Jesus happen after the first year that you accept Christ. After that, over the next five years, it declines to after year five of you accepting Jesus Christ, you tell nobody about him for the rest of your life. There's no leading voice out there right now crying out in the wilderness proclaiming the love and the name of Jesus Christ. Today we're going to look at a passage that's found in Luke 8 got your Bibles, you can flip there. If not, we're going to throw it on the screen. It's a parable of Jesus. Jesus told stories. He taught with stories, and he told stories that people could understand and, and grasp it. So we're going to look at one of those parables, and it starts like this with a glass of water. A farmer went out to plant a seed. As he scattered it across his field, some seed fell on a footpath where it was stepped on, and the birds ate it. Other seed fell among rocks. It began to grow, but the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up, and it choked out the tender plant. Still other seed fell on fertile soil. This seed grew and produced a crop that was a 100 times as much as had been planted. When he had said this, he called out, Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. I want to stop right there for a second and just tell some of y'all that it's okay that you don't understand every single passage in Scripture. You don't have to be a theology major to follow Jesus. His own disciples had to ask oftentimes, and I love the fact that Jesus patiently, right where they were at, took their question and answered it. He said this, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God, but I use parables to teach the others so that the scripture might be fulfilled. When they look, they won't really see. When they hear, they won't understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent from being and believing saved. The seeds on the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, again, we're talking about deep roots, they believe for a little while, and then they fall away when they face temptation. The seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. Oh. And so they never grow into maturity. And the seeds that fell on the good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. If you're taking notes this morning, it gets you into heaven quicker if you do. Sure. Um, here's your first point. The order matters. The order matters. We see it in the video that when you put all the other stuff in your bowl first and you try to fill it in with the God stuff, God doesn't fit. But when you put God in first, all of the rest of it fit. The order matters. We've become this world that focuses on the truth of social media and the truth of the newscasts and the truth of Hollywood and the truth of political parties. And the actuality is we veered so far away from the truth of scripture that it almost becomes unheard of for somebody to stand on the truth of the father. Uh, uh, an article I saw on Yahoo the other day would caught my attention as I was scrolling through looking at fantasy football. It said this, it said, True religion of America is now sports. And I just had to click on it to see. I'm like, ah, oh boy. And I know this is where y'all are going to go. Oh, here he goes with the Bryant Denny thing. And we ought to worship and all of that. I'm not going there. I just found it amusing that on a major news article, it said the religion in America 
in sports. So I clicked on it, and it was talking about the amount of billions of dollars, the amount of their words, worship, the amount of adoration for our college teams and our pro teams all across America has become such a big part of our lives that now all of the marketing in the world, it was a business article, it had nothing to do with church, but what they were saying is that sports has become the number one religion and the number one God in America. I find that sad, but I also find it true if you look around. I think oftentimes as churches, we get in here, we want to hammer on sports, we want to hammer on hunting, and we want to hammer on fish. I think as churches, we get in here and we're so worried about offering plates and classes and wall ornaments. And, and, and here's the truth of it is, is we get so far away from what truly matters. That when people who walk in looking for a sanctuary, when people who walk in looking for the Savior, when all they hear about is lights and walls and paint, that we've missed the order. And some of these are very important. But what truly matters? The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God lasts forever. Eternity is forever. All this stuff we're worried about, all the stuff that you go to work tomorrow morning, on a Monday morning, that you're going to be so worried about, can I tell you something? At the end of life, is going to cease to matter. At the end of life, you're not going to look back and say, man, I wish I'd spend more time at the office. Man, I wonder what they're thinking about me. What you're going to think about is what is next. Excuse me, I'm about to have a fit. <laughs> <coughs> oh, I felt that one coming. So sorry. It's really hard to like drive home points when you're coughing. Religion. The stuff that we get so worked up about. The do's and the don'ts. The bulletins and the, the regulations. The things we get so worked up about. Religion will be the biggest burden of your life if you don't fall in love with Christ. Religion will be the biggest burden of your life if you don't fall in love with Christ. You cannot live under the weight of the law. You can't do it. God gave us ten. Man decided he wasn't good enough, so he added about 600. And it became so crushing and so overwhelming that God looked down and said, it is crushing them. I need to send my son. We get crushed under the law. We get crushed under religion. Nobody's righteous. No, not one. But God sent his son. So we didn't have to live under the law. And Jesus knew. I found this in John 14, 15 inside of the Kids Passion Bible. I know y'all have never seen me use that version before. But it's awesome in the way that they said it. Loving me empowers you to obey my commandments. Think about that for a second. We don't obey his commandments because we're worried that he's going to zap us. Loving him so much that obeying his commandments come naturally. I use this when, when I'm in counseling a lot or when I'm talking to new believers. And, and, and I, I use this example. is I don't cheat on my wife because my dad told me not to. As a matter of fact, my dad told me on my wedding day, he said, son, if you screw this up, I'm going to kill you. <coughs> Excuse me, but I don't do it. Because I'm afraid my dad's going to kill me. The reason I don't is because I am so in love with my wife, I can't imagine somebody else being in the picture. And that's our beauty with God, is we should be so in love with him that, that, that following Scripture isn't a burden. Our love overflows to the point where we naturally follow his commandments. You see, this is a love letter. This is a love letter from God to us, he's given us the manual. He's giving us the blueprint. And I know oftentimes you'll roll your eyes and you say, so what, Pastor, you're saying I can't hunt? I never said that. Hunt away when you're in nature. You know what? Thank God. Thank God for the beauty. Thank God for the trees. Thank God for a nation that you can sit outside and worship him in a tree stand. You're saying I can't go to ball games? Absolutely not. Seek first the kingdom of God. You ought to be a walking billboard at your basketball game. You ought to be a walking billboard of Jesus Christ at Kentuck Park. 
You ought to be the walking billboard of Jesus Christ when you interact with that referee or that umpire. Think about that for a second. So what, Pastor, you're saying I should hate Muslims, I should hate, you know, homosexuals? You say, no, not at all. You should reach them. And this is where I think the church has got it so wrong. Is we should love and through our love, they should, will come to know the life changing power of Jesus Christ. Because there was a day, if you're sitting in here and you're a Christ follower, there was a day that somebody loved you enough to tell you about Christ. And he came into your life and he radically changed everything about you. Why would we not give that opportunity to everybody we see? We should be so in love with Jesus that it just comes out unstoppable. Whatever you place first goes in deeper. Whatever you place first goes in deeper. When you put the rocks of God first, it's an anchor. When you put the rocks of God first, it goes in deeper. Whatever you put in first goes deeper. Whatever you love the most goes deeper. It's the thing you'll sacrifice yourself for. It's the thing you'll sacrifice your time for. It's just the thing that you'll sacrifice your money for. Whatever you put first goes deeper. Everywhere you go is a mission field for Jesus. This is a building. The church is inside of you. We should be the church all throughout our community, in the boat, on the beach, at the workplace, in the classroom. You are a representative of Jesus Christ himself who died for you. Hand that to somebody else. And here's why. Because in a world of fake news, ministry matters. Ministry matters. Ministry isn't just an hour listening to a preacher singing a few songs. Ministry matters. Everything Jesus did, everybody he encountered was for a purpose. You see, ministry matters. He called us to grow his kingdom. He called us to reach the unreachable. He called us to run into situations. I heard this statement couple of weeks ago and I can't get it out of my head he called the church to run into situations that most people run away from I love that statement because when you look at the life of Jesus over and over and over you see him a woman in sexual sin where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn you. You see him touching lepers. They, they put these people off to the side and wouldn't even get near them. They'd hang bells on them so everybody would run when they came and Jesus walked right into him and he laid his hands on him. The crazy, the possessed. He didn't run away. He didn't walk around. He walked right up to him and he said, my peace I give unto you. You see, Jesus wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty because the ministry mattered. And he knew that order impacts the kingdom. Order impacts the kingdom. You see, what you put first, what you prioritize the most will impact the kingdom one way or another. You see, if you have Jesus rooted deepest, if you put Jesus first, you will grow the kingdom by, by your love. People are going to see you at work, and they're going to see your attitude, and they're going to see you around, and they're going to wonder what is different about them because you will stand out different in the world of hate. You'll stand out different in the world of animosity. You'll stand out different in a world of disunity. When your love is so overflowing, people will notice. People will notice and they will come up to you and they'll say, man, what is different? Over and over and over, Jesus knew it's about the kingdom. It's all about the kingdom. He knew that the kingdom matters. What is going on in this world is only temporary. We're going to die 100%. One out of one, we all die. Where we spend eternity, we get so worked up. I, I used to get so worked up in high school, right? A girlfriend broke up or this person didn't die. And it was just like the end of the world. And my dad used to tell me something. He said, son, none of this is going to matter. He said, you're not even going to see these people again. And you know what? God thought he was dumb. He got really smart after I graduated. None of it mattered. The same in this world. All the things we get so worked up about. The only thing that's going to matter is when we're standing before the Father. And 
Let me rephrase that. When we're kneeling before the Father, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, whether you do it there or you do it here. The order matters. The kingdom matters. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be given unto you. Seek first the kingdom. Hobbies will come. Sports will come. Hunting will come. Relationships will come. And actually, there will be so much more enhanced if you'll give him first. And I'll end it with this. Order communicates priority. Order communicates priority. You will know what is priority in your life when you look at your actions. You'll know what's priority in your life when you look at your worship. You see, in a world of fake news where it says, seek me first, it's what I want. It's what I need. It's my satisfaction. It's my happiness. God says, hey, I'll take care of that. As a matter of fact, I've created for you a place so amazing you can't even begin to fathom. You may go through it in this world, but I got something for you. If you would just focus on me, if you would just trust me, Seek me first. I'll give you all the rest on earth, but it pales in comparison to the place that I have for you. Galatians 4, 8, 9 says, Before you Gentiles knew God. By the way, that's us. Before you Gentiles knew God, you were slaves to so-called gods that do not even exist. So now that you know God, or should I say now that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of the world? Wow. Once we've accepted Christ, why in the world would we want to go back? I got a question for you this morning. Are you kingdom focused? Is your priority Jesus Christ? What is first in your life? I don't mean what's first on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. I mean what's first in your life on Monday. What's first in your life on Thursday. What's first in your life on Friday night. What's first in your life on Saturday afternoon. What's first in your life. Fake news says if I just sprinkle enough Jesus, right? I, I come, got my Jesus on this morning. I'll go out the rest of the week, and the rest of the week is mine. I gave God his, right? Uh, that's what the world says. That's fake news. Jesus says, seek me first. Make me your everything. Be so in love with me that it overflows and everybody sees me through your love. Everybody sees me through your attitude. Everybody sees me through your actions. Seek first me. And hey, I'll take care of the rest. Who do you encounter every day that doesn't know Christ? You see, I believe... I really believe this. It's not in here. I just believe it. I believe there's going to come a day that we're standing in heaven and every single person God brought in our path is going to flash before our eyes. And my biggest fear is that I look at the Father and he asks me this question, why? What were you so focused on? As you see them going this way, that breaks my heart. What are we so focused on? outside of his kingdom. I wonder, day in and day out, what, what I place first in my life. Are you the seed that lands on rocky soil? Maybe you're in here and you've heard the gospel before. Maybe you've, you've had a bad experience at church or with Christians. You've heard it and you're just like, ah, I just came because my dad made me. I just came to get a date or donuts or whatever it was. Maybe you're the seed that landed on rocky soil where you would say, I've heard it, I know it, I'm here, whatever, but God's not a priority. And you easily fall away. And it's what you want over what God wants. It's what your moral compass says, not what the Bible says. It's what you feel like doing, not what God's instructed us to do. Maybe you're the seed that is in thorns. You believe, but you fell away, chasing the almighty dollar, chasing stuff, chasing status, chasing pleasure. It's more important about what people think of me than my Savior. You ignore what God says is sin. Maybe you're just wrapped up with thorns. 
Maybe you're the seed that just has never accepted and never believed. I want to encourage you this morning to make that right. I want to encourage you this morning. If God isn't first in your life, make that right. I want to encourage you this morning. If you're the seed that's in fertile soil and you're giving God your all and he's first in your life, I want to encourage you to get out of your seat and get out of the building and start proclaiming his name. We need voices in the wilderness. It is not time for the church to be quiet anymore. We don't have to be okay with it. As a matter of fact, we're taught not to be. We're taught to love. And we're taught to go into the world, into your work, into your school, into your ball fields, and proclaim the name of Jesus. It's not a two-hour Sunday morning thing. It's an every hour, every day, every week thing. Seek first the kingdom of God. As we close out today, the altar's open. Get your seed right with Jesus. In Jesus' name. Father, this morning, we come to you. And we just want to say thank you. Thank you for sending your son to die for us. Thank you for giving us grace when we don't deserve it. God, I can't imagine. I can't imagine looking at somebody in the eye, standing in heaven, and knowing they're not going to get in, and there was something I could do about it. God, I pray if there's somebody in this room today that doesn't know you, that they will hear this, not as a, not as a sermon of aggression from a gravelly-voiced dude, but God, that they'll hear it as, a, as an offer of love, right where they're at with whatever junk they have that they will know that you died for them and that their eternity can be secure by accepting you. God, I pray that they accept you this morning. For those who don't have their priorities right, God, I pray they come back to the Father. They come back to their first love. That they know that you love them so much that their love should be overflowing. If they're not passionate about you, God, I pray that they rekindle their passion. And we give you all the glory. In 